Hey everybody, I have a feeling some of you are thinking right now, didn't Charles upload this video yesterday? And I did. However, rather unfortunately and quite ironically, I was rushing quite a bit to get this video out because I have so many other videos I need to catch up on thanks to the move that I got a bunch of facts wrong and this video stands to correct this. I'd like to apologize to all of you and I really hope that you're willing to watch this again and forgive me for messing up. Thank you. Hey everybody! Now that Halloween in July is over and all the new chaos in my life has seemingly subsided for the time being, I think it's time we finally got around to doing the first patron voted video. Now, uh, let's see here. It was a while since we did that vote because that was what, back in April? But I should have it right here. Oh. Oh no. Well, if this is what the patrons voted for, this is what the patrons are getting. So we've covered a lot of immersive sims on this channel, each being better than the last. System Shock 2, Prey, Deus Ex, Hard Time, all greats of the niche. Unfortunately, today we're going to be covering a bad immersive sim. Like a really, really bad one. Arguably the worst immersive sim ever made. I'm talking non-existent story, janky combat, not even broken but straight up unimplemented AI from allies and enemies alike, physics glitches that can and will kill you levels of bad. That's right folks, today we'll be doing a video on Underworld Ascendant. Underworld Ascendant is the ill-fated crowdfunded game by One Other Side Entertainment who ended up rushing the game out the door to make the Christmas sales rush of 2018 as they were already two years behind schedule and unfortunately they paid very dearly for that mistake. If Other Side Entertainment sounds familiar to you, that's because it was a studio founded by one Paul Nurath who was originally part of Looking Glass Studios, the studio that helped create the original immersive sims Ultima Underworlds 1 and 2. Nurath also had a hand in developing the first two Thief games, System Shock 2, and even helped out with the original spiritual successor to the Ultima games, Arx Fatalis. Other Side Entertainment decided to launch a Kickstarter in early 2015 announcing Underworld Ascendant as a return to form for the immersive sim as a genre or whatever you'd like to call it, and the rest was history. So the first trouble spot for Underworld Ascendant was that it was at least in some aspect meant to be a spiritual successor to Ultima Underworld or as close to being Ultima Underworld 3 as they could get over at Other Side. There was one problem with that though. Electronic Arts still owned the rights to all the franchises made by Origin System, including the Ultima and Ultima Underworld series. Luckily, or perhaps unluckily, after a bit of rights negotiations, Other Side was allowed to use certain names and likenesses from Ultima Underworld, but they could not call the game Ultima Underworld 3 or anything of the like. In the end, that might have been for the better though. In Underworld Ascendant, you still play as the Avatar and you're still in the Underworld just like in the first game. Heck, other things from previous games like the Labyrinth of Worlds are mentioned, but this is not an Ultima game. It just happens to be a very similar vein of those games and features a lot of the same names from it. Because legal reasons. The next major issue is that while the game was fully funded to their Kickstarter goal and then some, it was still a crowdfunded game game meaning that Other Side Entertainment didn't get all of the money that was pledged to them as no matter what service you're using, it needs to take a cut of the money you get in order to survive. Additionally, now you've got a bunch of people poking you about when the game's gonna be done and you're somewhat beholden to the launch date that you promised- <laughs> Who am I kidding? When has a Kickstarter ever came out on time? Regardless, you're somewhat beholden to a launch date that you promised when you first pitched the project, regardless of missed estimations of the time you need to complete it, unforeseen complications, and so on. And like many other Kickstarters we've heard about and then gawked at, Underworld Ascendant was years late. The Kickstarter was launched in early 2015 with rewards and game promise to be delivered by late 2016, but as we all know, the game officially launched in November of 2018. I can't be certain as to what exactly was going on during those two years, but after a few delay announcements on the Kickstarter page, they also announced in October of 2017 that 505 Games would now be publishing Underworld Ascendant, and it eventually got out the door a year later to painful results. Insult to injury? Of course, the physical rewards were way, way late, and also not exactly what was promised. How late? Well, 
the posted announcement saying that they had finally fulfilled all backer rewards came in February of this year. That's right, if you wanted that big box copy of Underworld Ascendant in the parchment map of the Underworld, you ended up waiting six years to get your stuff. Insult to injury is that the big box copy ended up being a clamshell Blu-ray case and the map was nowhere near as cool as they said it was going to be. I'm just going off what people in the comments of these updates on the Kickstarter page said, as there are no official images of these rewards, nor could I find any images posted of them. Uh, by the way, if by some off chance, like someone who funded Underworld Ascendant, who got those things eventually is watching this, uh, would you mind like me coming by the Discord and posting what exactly it looked like? I'm actually kind of curious about what the final rewards looked like. And man, we haven't even gotten into the reception of this game yet, and it's already a disaster. This whole fact pattern is so bad, I tried to drop a line to Mr. Matt McMuscles a while back for a potential collaboration on this video, but what happened to that is that I wasn't a very smart lad and either sent the pitch email to the wrong email address or it got filtered to spam as I forgot to put a subject line on the thing. But let's talk about the uh, critical reception of the game now. So UA was somehow late and rushed at the same time, which knowing some of the boondoggles we've recently seen, this isn't exactly all that surprising. On top of all the delays and spotty communication, someone, likely the suits at 505 Games, decided that was enough was enough and told them to get it out by Christmas of 2018. Now, I don't exactly know what they were spending their time on beforehand, but it certainly wasn't QA or even figuring out the core gameplay loop, like getting it all dialed in. So what did come out on the 15th of November 2018 wasn't nearly ready for reviews and players alike to take a look at it. Underworld Ascendant was absolutely bodied by critics and players alike. It presently sits at a 37 aggregate review score on Metacritic with exactly zero positive critical reviews and a 2.1 user score. Edwin Evans Thurwell sums it up best with the tagline of his Eurogamer review by calling Underworld Ascended a blatantly unfinished and uninspired nostalgia project in the tagline of his review. I honest to goodness completely forgot about this game when it came out because it was so late I kind of fell out of my personal radar. And then when I went to do the MSIM video, I thought that I had looked up the wrong game on Metacritic, but after I was 90 minutes into Underworld Ascendant, I uninstalled the game out of pure revulsion. So yeah, those reviewers and players were on the money. This game is inexcusably bad. The three core styles of play are the usual sneaky, spellsy, slashy styles, and I tried all three of them. They all suck. Stealth is broken thanks to broken AI. Take a good look at these shots from the tutorial because these are the only places that you'll be seeing the AI doing what it is supposed to do, except for this guy right here. The rest of the time, the AI somehow always sees you but doesn't chase after you or vice versa. The least offensive of the three is traditional melee and ranged weapons. Melee has a quick and charged attack, which as far as I can tell, don't do too much of a difference in time time to kill, and staggering enemies seems to be kind of random anyway. Your choice for melee weapons are knives, which are kind of meant for stealthy players, a one-handed sword, a one-handed bonk stick, or something vaguely resembling a one-handed axe. Underworld Ascendant doesn't support shields or two-handed weapons. Sometimes these weapons will have effects in the later game, but none of them are particularly good, and also outside of the monetary value of each weapon when you go to the vendor, you're not really given any info on just how good a weapon is stats-wise. Arrows are nice, but they are obtuse in every way possible, including some ways that I hadn't even thought that your ranged weapons could be obtuse. You'll always have a bow on your person no matter what, and it might confuse you for a minute in the beginning of the game, as you'll have to guess your way into figuring out that you equip arrows, not the bow. On top of that, if you try to immediately fire your arrows after equipping, you'll do this weird little wind up and then awkwardly punch with your fist that's holding the arrow instead of drawing your bow. This is never useful, even in whatever weird situation that other side might have imagined this might be convenient to do. If that's not enough for you, Underworld Ascendant also doesn't have a proper way to equip a singular type of arrow. You have to drag a stack of arrows into your hotbar and equip them that way. Then, once you run out, you have to drag another stack of arrows down into that hotbar slot or switch to another hotbar slot as Underworld Ascendant never figured out how to automatically move the next stack of ammunition for whatever you're using into where you're using it like literally any other game. That leaves spellcasting. 
Spellcasting would be pretty good if not for certain jank elements in the game, but now that I say that out loud, that statement applies to pretty much all three combat styles of this game. We'll talk more about magic and runes in a sec when I talk about poorly implemented ideas for the game, but for now, we'll leave it as certain things like abusing the fact that spells will fire from where you cast them will let you corner camp enemies, and it's almost worth it if not for the poor balancing of the skill tree, which makes collecting mana a nightmare. A big problem with this is that you don't really regenerate mana naturally, nor do eaten items really give you any more, but instead you have to collect these near invisible motes of mana, which at the beginning of the game literally are invisible, but they only seem to be able to be collected when you are standing inside of them. I initially thought that it was like specifically inside the chest or solar plexus, but upon reviewing my footage here, it looks like as long as your player model is physically touching the mode of mana, you can absorb it. Problem with that is that it needs to be very specifically inside the player model, which is very hard for you to judge based on how the game operates. You can eventually get an upgrade that lets you collect motes from a distance, but by the time you have that upgrade, you're going to already be at the end game of the increased mana pool, making it near useless as the mana motes seem to restore a set percentage of your mana instead of like a numerical amount. I don't know why they don't let you just have mana potions or anything. This is obtuse, but I personally, I would have been okay with this if like, what you get as an upgrade for like range collecting mana was the base version and then the upgrade lets you like collect mana from like five feet out but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here in the end how you do combat or sneak past combat doesn't matter thanks to late game ai no matter what style or styles you choose to use though you're going to be hampered by the terrible movement the ascendant moves like he's walking barefoot on wet concrete and the auto mantle never does what you want it to do to the point that you will die at least once to accidentally mantling off a leg this stings a lot because this game leans hard into how imsim it is and wants you to stack some boxes every other minute or so, but the crappy player handling makes trying to jump on more than one box a nightmare. It also doesn't help the game's case that your base speed is pretty slow and that most pieces of heavy armor will incur an additional speed penalty, which makes the already slow movement mind-numbing. I figured out a little too late that you can plant your respawn tree just about anywhere where there's dirt, but a lot of the major quest areas in this game are completely paved over and you're gonna find yourself having to backtrack to those areas a lot. Like Ascended really likes to make you run back and forth across the levels. The game got tolerable towards the end when I got a bunch of high-end items that buffed my speed up to 125% after skill points and I personally think that this 125% speed should have been the baseline. Outside of the combat and the poor movement, Underworld Ascendant has a lot of weird, poorly implemented systems that might have been novel if they were worked on a bit more by people who had experience making more current games. We'll get to the second half of that comment towards the end of the video though. There's a lot of things that maybe could have been cool if they also had the normal version of what they were doing as a baseline or would have been tolerable if they had made sure the rest of the game was at fun or at the very least functional. The first place this will really start to sting you is the feat system. You don't level up in Underworld Ascendant. You accomplish feats of skill that award you with a single skill point that you can go spend at this one guy's stall in the hub world of Markal. Problem is that a lot of these are tied to already having certain skills unlocked or are just too out of the way to get done. Lucky for me, there are also feats for accomplishing certain parts of the story so that I could try to make a decent build. You know, if they had a baseline leveling system where I get experience points for kills, completing quests and the like, and each level granted you a single skill point, I would have been more than willing to invest my points into other trees in the name of doing feats. As it is though, I just ended up looking through the compendium for easy to do feats so I could get what I needed for the build I went with and move on. Next is the quest system. Quests are given to you by the mediator lizard lady on each level and they're essentially the most vanilla quests ever. Go free this guy from a prison in the dungeon. Go kill four dudes. Go kill this thing in this area. Go get the key. The kicker is that on top of these quests being horribly buggy for a myriad of reasons, they don't reward you in a traditional manner. Instead, at the end of every quest, you'll be brought to a mission completion screen where you'll get a coin reward depending on how much you varied your tactics during the mission and there will also be additional rewards based on doing things a certain way such as going undetected going without taking damage, or even without so much as equipping a weapon or spell. This would be great, save for the way the quests are, they don't seem to be limited to the highlighted quest area, but literally from the moment you accept the quest until you complete it. Need to heal up after the last quest? Tough luck, bud. You just lost your bonus. Did the enemy AI briefly see you through walls across the map due to weird coding? No bonus for you. The best part of this feature is that it was never finished as evidenced by the bonuses you get. You get like maybe 10 to 15 extra pieces of silver for a varied place 
style at the end of each quest during the first level of the dungeon, and you'll be getting the exact same amount at the very end when you're completing the final quest of the game. No one had or was willing to take the time to make sure that the rewards scaled with how far along you are in the game, because 12 silver pieces doesn't amount to much when the gear you're going to want for the end game is between 5 and 10 grand. Admittedly, money doesn't matter too much, as they also forgot to add checks for if you've already collected an item in the level loading, whatever you call it. So if you find a chest with a bunch of money bags near the beginning of a level, you can just run in, grab it, run out of the level, then load the level in again, again and again, until you have enough money for whatever you want. And I guess it also wouldn't be fair if I did not mention that you do also on the little podium near the quest giver, you'll get additional rewards for each quest, but it's still nowhere near enough to like do the things you actually want. That brings us to the magic system, which is easily the most interesting thing that Underworld Ascendant does, and possibly out of all the offbeat things it does, it is the most well implemented, likely because it is a wholesale port of how magic was done in Ultima Underworld 1 and 2 all those years ago. Instead of individual spells, you get a bag of runes that you can mix and match to make spells. What do each of those spells do? Well, that's for you to find out and label appropriately. Good luck, slugger. The game does give you a few of the more useful spells via graffiti on the walls, and you can find magic wands with spells baked into them and even rewrite those spells, but those aren't of very much use as they still require mana. I could take this or leave this as I've described it here, but we're gonna talk more about magic in the designated jank section of this video, and that's right, there is so much jank in this game that even on top of all the things I have previously talked about, there is still enough for an entire section of just nothing but jank. So the last big element of the gameplay we'll talk about here is that everywhere that they could try to do an emergent gameplay thing, they did. Papyrus will keep telling you to use unorthodox methods to do things. Anything that's wooden can burn. Doors you don't have the proper keys to or barricades included. Switches can be hit with just about any kind of projectile. Magic attacks, arrows, thrown objects, whatever. As long as something touches the switch with enough force, you can throw it from a distance. The problem with this is that one, even in places where it's well implemented, it's not all that novel to the point that you find yourself just doing the same thing over and over again to progress. And two, it's not really emergent gameplay if it's something that the devs are explicitly making you do. A good analog for how emergent gameplay is the way it is and a staple of immersive sims is like how one of the writers of the Elder Scrolls franchise said about stories in an open world game. You have to be prepared for the players to take the story that you've written and rip out the pages to make paper airplanes with, which is what emergent gameplay is to a core gameplay loop. You're completely ignoring what you're supposed to do and just going about in a way that the devs didn't quite intend. Good examples of this are the glue gun from Prey or getting creative with explosives in Deus Ex. When you're made to burn down doors on a regular basis to progress and you're literally handed a magic wand that will stack boxes for you in the mid game, it's not so emergent as it is ho-hum gameplay where the devs are telling you, hey, remember all those times when we made those cool and novel games that won awards? Through their level design. All right, everyone. Time for a break from the pain so that we might feel it fresh upon our skin when we return to the video. Let's do a cooking segment to reset our tolerances. Today we're going to do what I call lazy fried rice, which is essentially a proxy to anything that could be called authentic fried rice that can be cooked quickly and easily provided you did a bit of prep beforehand. This stuff also makes for great leftovers and we're going to be making it in a large batch here. The first order of business is to cook and then chill your rice ahead of time. If you've ever tried to make fried rice before and it got all mushy before you even served it, it's likely because you took the rice fresh out of the pot and right into the fryer so it never stopped cooking. It just kept cooking and cooking after already being done until it was all overcooked and mushy by the time you served it. Cook the rice however you wanna and then when it's done, place it in a bowl uncovered and place that bowl in the freezer for 90 minutes. After 90 minutes, transfer it to the refrigerator and cover it if you aren't quite ready to use it. Okay, now that you're ready, get all your ingredients together. Today we're going to be going for some shrimp, a high eat oil like grapeseed, a bag of veggies, and as many many beaten eggs as you'd like, then soy sauce, and maybe some red pepper flakes and garlic if you're feeling spicy. Beat your eggs thoroughly and salt them a bit if you wanna to get a nice color going before it's their time, and then put a large saucepan under high heat on the stove. Now here's the part where I tell you that this can be done as a one pan meal if you'd like to cook the shrimp first and then wait, but today we're gonna take another pan and set that on high heat to cook the shrimp separately as I really don't wanna undercook seafood. While the main pan is warming up, go ahead and throw the shrimp onto the frying 
frying pan and let them cook for a couple minutes on each side. This shouldn't take too long. Once the shrimp have been tossed a little to get some color and make the C for cooked shape, take them out of the pan and put them on a paper towel line something or other so that the excess oil and water can drain off them before they go into the final mix, preventing a watery fried rice. Okay, everything's prepped and the saucepan is hot. Get your rice and put it into the oiled saucepan, taking care to use a wooden spoon or something to get it all nice and broken up before we start adding more stuff. Now take your bag of frozen veggies, open her up, and just toss it right in there, stirring it to mix it too. It's cool. If anything, the frozen state of the veggies helps prevent your rice from overcooking while everything else is in there. Maybe add some fresh cracked pepper here too if you wanna. Keep mixing everything together, and as soon as the pan gets all nice and hot again, make a well in the middle of your rice mix, and then put some extra oil in there and add the eggs. Give it a count of 10, then stir it up with the wooden spoon. Repeat that until you've got a nice bunch of little curdly egg curds that you can mix into your rice. All right, time to wrap it all up. Add in your red pepper flakes and press in one clove of garlic if you wanna, and then put in your shrimp. Now take your soy sauce and pour it over the rice before mixing everything together. I find that going one quarter way around the pan is the minimum sauciness and going all the way around one rotation is the maximum amount of soy sauce this rice can hold before it becomes unbearable. I personally usually shoot for between between one half to two thirds of the way around the pan. Once the sauce is in, kill the heat and keep stirring until everything is all nice and the same color. Now portion it out and enjoy. Now, if all that wasn't enough to make you never play this game, let's talk about all the jank that wasn't in the gameplay section of this video. Let's start with the enemies and their AI, which is broken at best and non-existent the rest of the time. Part of me thinks that they only programmed the AI for the first area of the game, as that seems to be the only place where it works properly. The rest of the enemy AI will never pass to you right and frequently runs around corners to come get you, loses sight of you midway through and forgets about fighting you, thinking it lost you, and then it all starts over again as you close the gap to fight them. It only gets worse from there. As you go into lower and lower levels of the Stygian Abyss, the enemies become less and less coded to the point that towards the last level of the dungeon and the final boss encounter, they literally just stand there and do nothing. Like all they had time to do was place the enemies, but they did not add any sort of programming to them besides like the default, hey, if I see you, I'm gonna come after you. Except I'm not even sure they added that because I was running right in front of some people and they never even came for me. I kid you not, the final level of this game game is literally you just casually walking up to all the keyholes unopposed as the enemies that are supposed to be fighting you just stand there. All right, just for the sake of fairness here and to show that I'm not out to just completely destroy this game, after reviewing my footage, a few of the enemies in the final level did notice and attack me, but the majority of them just kind of stood there and watched me, or they just kind of casted their spells at nothing in particular. Which is also what the friendly eye does from the outset. After freeing any of the Saurian allies, they'll just awkwardly wander around nearby where the cage was and occasionally swipe at nothing in particular. Enemies can be a few feet away from them and within their line of sight, and they still won't do anything. The only AI that seems to work as intended are that of the animuses of the Liches, but those are essentially stationary turrets. Underworld Ascendant is also horribly unoptimized. I've got this thing running on an SSD on hardware that blows anything that was around when this game came out clear of the water, but this game still takes a while to load in levels, and then when I am in the dungeons, it stutters like crazy. I'm only running this game on 1080p because I like my frames high, and I could install this game onto my friggin' VRAM if I wanted to, and still have enough left over for system requirements. I don't know what they were working on for those three and a half years of development or so, but if the QA team was telling these guys anything, other side wasn't putting it into practice for whatever reason. I guess that while I'm here, I'll also mention that this game uses a lot of the same icons for different things, which makes it a nightmare to manage inventory at times. And then we have the physics. Oh God, the physics. This game is like goat simulator levels of bad physics, except it isn't a joke, nor is the game built around it. It's just the bane of your existence as you try to make it to the end of the game. Meet the single most dangerous enemy in this game, climbing chains. I died more to jumping on chains than I did to all the other things that were supposed to kill me combined. Whenever you jump on a chain, the physics will freak out for a bit and launch you up and down. If you're too close to the ceiling or the floor, 
you will crash into it with enough force to instantly kill you. Too bad that there are several areas in the game where you're going to need to jump onto chains near their top part to progress. I have no idea why these physics were left in the game, when the chains could have easily been de physics to act like ladders in a source game or something. And then we've got the fire, or should I say the consequences of it. While for some reason you do not take fire damage, when you set something on fire, the game makes it quote unquote burn by replacing the singular object with a bunch of smaller objects that make up the pieces of let's say, a door, and then those eventually despawn as wood burns away. It's fine for most of the time, however when larger things start to burn, all the little objects start to source collide and these can and will kill you if you get anywhere near them. Also for some reason your fireball spell is a physical ball that you can pick up and throw instead of a projectile like literally any other game, which can be very useful for using the fireball to light more things on fire, but having more than three of these out at a time will lag the game even more than it normally does, and also it's a pain to use it as a weapon because rather than setting enemies on fire, it'll just bounce off them unless you like do it in a really specific way against a stationary enemy. Oh yeah, and this game will sometimes just smack you straight into the sky for no reason. And there's also how sometimes the game just doesn't know what to do with the physics of a corpse if it falls in a certain way. And despite this game heavily, heavily incentivizing you to stack boxes and other objects, certain objects just don't want to be stacked with one another and will keep on freaking out or just falling apart. The less interacting you do with anything while playing this game, the better your odds are of not getting yeeted into space and hitting a kill plane. So in addition to the terrible physics and non-existent AI, this game also has no quality of life stuff that you'd expect in most games and it makes it really hard to do basic things like managing your inventory. So on top of all the weird quirks about spell casting in this game, including that half of the spells will just kill you for the trespass of trying to cast them, there is no way to organize your spells in game. You just get this big old list of everything that you have ever tried casting before and whatever you've recently used will be at the top. While you can rename your DIY spells once you figure out what the heck they do, if you're able to figure out what they do, you get almost no feedback as to what exactly the spell is when you first make it outside of if it's supposed to hurt someone, heal someone, or conjure something, meaning that most of your spell book will be a blank wall of new spells with heal person, fireball, giant fist, and flutter on top of everything, with everything else going unused because every time you tried to use it, it just killed you because apparently the rules for spells in this game is if a spell does not have a target for an offensive attack, it just targets you. And the spells are specific to certain kinds of enemies, which means if you try to use a harm person spell on something that the game considers a beast, it'll just harm you. And just... Ugh, I wanted to like the spellcasting in this game, but it's just so inexcusable how they executed it. Also, our old friends Weapon Durability and Hunger are here, despite being half finished. While the usual issues with weapon durability are mostly remedied by the fact that chests reset every time you enter a floor, meaning you have an unlimited supply of weapons, hunger is a different story as half the food items don't even cure hunger. Like I get this for like hallucinogenic leaves and stuff, but it's weird how eating a bunch of fruit or certain meats does nothing to how sated I feel. Then there's also how the map is pretty hard to read and you can't zoom in or anything to try and make it more readable. It's just one of the million little things that bug me about this game on top of the glaring issues, like how I have slots for an Animal Companion, which supposedly was a backer award, and a backpack to expand my inventory, but not once did I come across these things in game. Or how the hub world of Markal is utterly dead, save for the vendors, the skill point guy, and the representatives of each of the factions, which you will never see or hear from outside of audio diaries, and the representatives can't interact with you in any way. There's stuff you can see that's sometimes just out of your range that makes you think that at one point they plan to actually have something in Markal, but as it is, the hub world just reminds you that you're playing an unfinished game. Now, rather than do a deep dive into the whole story like I usually do, I'm just going to summarize it here as there isn't a lot to go on. Spoilers, I guess, but I don't recommend you ever put this on your hard drive. So you get spirited away to Papyrus's magical party dungeon because you're the special guy who's going to stop the evil bad guy from a much better game from waking up. And Papyrus wanted to originally get all three factions that are not in this game to do it, but they didn't like his spaghetti magic, so they all wandered off to another game or something. You do a bunch of quests that would make up the first level of any RPG other than this one, and all along the way you collect audio diaries that tell you that everyone thinks that Papyrus is a big fat meanie head, so maybe you shouldn't go along with his plans. You get to the final level of the game, you steal Papyrus's death mask and use it to permanently banish him back to Undertale, along with Typhon, and then the game ends. There you go, that's the whole story. There is nothing to this. This game is so bland that I was mostly 
on my own for this one, as there are literally no proper walkthroughs of it. And even among all the people who paid money for this game on Kickstarter, including the people who spent hundreds of dollars for like a map or something, no one bothered to ever add any articles to the official wiki. A uh, quick update, while I was editing, I also found this other wiki that is clearly curated by the developers, or at least while they were making the game it was curated. But this one also features a bunch of like stub pages for a lot of stuff that simply never made it into the game and really isn't all that helpful for someone that is actually trying to play the release version. Also, just to satisfy your curiosity and prove to you that I'm not trying to pull a fast one on you right now, while the Underworld fandom wiki does say it has 375 pages and 53 articles, the overwhelming majority of them are stubs. Like, you can't really find anything. You go to, like, the items page and everything you click through is a stub. It, it has nothing on it. The only thing I really found that actually was helpful was there is a list of all the skills available and their cost, but this is essentially copied and pasted out of information that was already like easily accessible in game. And then as I looked through all the other articles on the fandom wiki, just to do my due diligence, I noticed the same thing that was happening in the developer wiki was there, where there are a bunch of items that just didn't make it into the game listed on the wiki. And the few things that did make it into the game, which are listed on the wiki, like say this article about corn only has cursory information and not anything you actually would want to know, like what kind of effects does it have? What does it do? Where else can I find it in the world instead of just from a vendor? And same story with weapons. The few weapons that are actually in the game have no damage tables or where I can find them. Out of curiosity, I looked at the edit history for a few of these articles and I found that they were all made around July of 2018 once the game was getting ready to launch and they were all made by the admin for at the time Gamepedia, Alianen. I, I hope I said that right. I wouldn't be surprised if this was a service that Gamepedia and now Fandom offers where if you've got a game coming up, they'll gladly set up your wiki for a set fee and then just after the game launched, nobody could be bothered to go to the wiki and fill it out as expected. But this also begs the question, why on earth did you do this if you already had the other wiki set up? And then why on earth did you not take all the assets from the other wiki and put them on the fandom wiki? And I think this is just a sign of just how mismanaged development might have been. We have no way to confirm or deny any of this stuff because the more I look into Underworld Ascendant, the more nebulous it gets. But this is not something people with a clear mindset do. There are, however, two quote unquote walkthroughs of this game, one of which is some guy shamelessly embedding his let's play onto guide sites everywhere he can, and the other being a no commentary playthrough that helped me gauge just how long this game was supposed to take me. Another thing that these videos helped me clear up is the confusion around whether or not this game was ever supposed to be a rogue light or rogue like. I personally remember there being talk about how there would be ever changing elements of the Stygian Abyss, and I remember seeing one sort of video where they were showing Underworld Ascendant at a convention and talking about that, where like you take objectives and then go into the Stygian Abyss but for the life of me, I cannot find that video to confirm it, nor can I find anything coming up on a search when I put in Underworld Ascendant and Roguelike. And I know I'm not the only person who thinks this because every other person I bring this game up to is like, oh yeah, wasn't that like supposed to be some kind of roguelite or something? But I just can't seem to find anything confirming or denying that this game was ever intended to have randomized elements or not. It's entirely possible that I and everyone else who thinks this is just misremembering or we misread something during the Kickstarter when they were talking about randomized quests like towards the end of the game where like after you complete an area you get to choose from these quests, but at the same time, if anyone could show me anything confirming or denying that this ever took place, that would be very much appreciated because information about this game outside the Kickstarter and a few very vague interviews that are all about five minutes long each, there is scant information about the development of Underworld Ascendant. I checked my footage that I currently have against the footage I have three years ago from the Immersive Sim Mega video against these two Let's Plays, and we all had the same level layouts for our dungeon. I think the quest might have been randomized though, as I get stuff like, hey, go collect three fruits off the Ripper trees, despite all the trees being dead and looted already. In spite of all of this that I've just mentioned, even when Underworld Ascendant isn't being a horribly broken and blatantly unfinished game, even when nothing is going wrong in the game, it still feels boring and empty. Like a game that maybe shouldn't have been made or at the very least have been scrapped and remade learning lessons from your previous build. Nothing feels meaningful while you're playing. You just go from level to level, backtracking your way back and forth across the map through meaningless quests to get 
get the next key to go down to the next level and do it all over again. This game has flashes of brilliance like when you first get the flutter spell, but you might not even be able to use it if you got the wrong build going. And it's kind of telling that the only moments of joy I felt in this game was when I unlocked an ability that allowed me to play it much faster by skipping large parts of it. I kid you not, I had to force myself to play by the end of this game by turning on the finest of the GDQ speedruns, making myself a very strong cocktail, and then when I finally hadn't gotten to the end, I had to make myself another very strong cocktail to numb the sensation of raw, unfiltered, emergent gameplay with nothing else going for it. And I was able to get through all of Radical Heights and Command & Conquer 4 sober, by the way. Now, if all of this wasn't bad enough, the worst thing of all is that this isn't even the release version of the game. That version is far, far worse. What we've been talking about for the last however many minutes this video has been going on and what we've been showing on the screen is update four, the oh god we're so sorry for rushing this please reconsider your reviews edition of Underworld Ascendant. Some gaming outlets like PC Gamer did try and revisit Underworld Ascendant and were like, yeah this is still bad. And I agree with them. It's terrible. The version of Underworld Ascendant that they shipped is far worse than what we've discussed here. And thank goodness I did not play this at launch, nor did I pledge any money to the Kickstarter as I don't know what I would have done my with myself at the time. One of the saddest things about this game is that on the main menu, there's a dead DLCs page with nothing on except for a check back soon message. Other side was banking on this being a hit, but in the end, even after they tried to fix the base game, it was still so unsalvageable that they either never bothered to or just didn't have the time time and resources to make DLCs that they planned for Underworld Ascendant. In the end, Underworld Ascendant is an inexcusably bad game and easily the worst immersive sim ever made to date. Other Side had everything going for them. They were fully funded. They had no meddling producers or deadlines until they were willingly brought in. They took all the extensions that they thought they needed and got whatever help they asked for, but this game still turned out like it did even after years of patching to try and fix this. Don't buy this. It's not worth $30. I'm not even sure it's worth $1. If you are really, really hankering for the Ultima Underworld World 3 experience, there was this game that came out in the early 2000s called Arx Fatalis made by our boys Arcane Studios, which by the way recently got its 20th anniversary update, so now I'm not even sure you need the Arx Libertatis mod to play it as they gave it an update that made it play nice with modern systems. Go check that out. It's significantly cheaper than Underworld Ascendant even at full price. If there's a lesson we can take away from this, it's that just because someone made amazing games in the past doesn't mean that that skill translates into being able to make games in a modern setting. Games have become exponentially more complicated than they were 20 or even 10 years ago, and making a game for DOS or early DirectX is a lot different than making a game in DX12 or even in Unity Engine. Maybe we have to accept that while it's not impossible for people to regain their spark, it's very easy to lose your edge. I think it's better to remember people for the good stuff they made in their prime than it is to remember them during the later years of their career though, and just to be happy that we had good times in the first place. So up next, we're going to have that belated 100,000 subscribers special of Deus Ex Human Revolution, but since that one's going to take a hot minute because I am pulling out as many steps as I can, I'll have a couple smaller videos to get you guys by in the meantime. Be sure to mosey on over to patreon.com slash charlatanwonder where you can get early access to videos, uncut versions of commentary videos, 4k cat clips, cooking segments with full recipes, and choose to vote on what next among so many other things. If you can't or won't, it's cool. I'm still going to be making these videos to the best of my ability. I really hope to see you all in the next video. And in the meantime, please stay safe, stay hydrated, follow CDC guidelines and wear your mask in public indoor spaces, wash your hands, and enjoy this cat video. What is this? The hamper I left by the door is knocked over. And someone is lurking inside. Frisk, you are not dirty pants. Why are you in here? You don't go on the washing machine. Why are you in the hamper? Lovely wafflies. Mr. Chunkily Donks. You know, I'm gonna have to make you get out of that in about half an hour. Actually, no, I don't need to make you get out of that because, like, they got, like, little carts in the laundry room. But still, what you doing? We bought you a perfectly nice tube. Is that not good enough? Are you too good? to be a tube boy? <laughs> Do 
You're making mommy sneeze. She's allergic to hamper boys. I just... I worry about you sometimes, Frisk. You're doing silly things. Can I have a scritch? Yeah, kind of get a scritch in here. Fine, I'll leave you alone. <laughs>